Thank you. So now I am very pleased to introduce um, our speaker this afternoon on artificial intelligence. Um, she's getting her thumb drive everything set up right now, but um, uh, Professor Mal Mal Malachia, am I close? Mahaicha. <laughs> um, is the Janice Jenkins Collegiate Professor of Computer Science and Director of the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory um, in our College of Engineering. Um, she holds a PhD in Computer Science from Southern Methodist and a PhD in Linguistics from Oxford. In 2008, she was awarded the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers by President Obama. Um, and she is also an outspoken promoter of diversity in computer science. Um, supporting an expansion of traditional analysis of educational success, which tends to focus on academic behavior to include student life, personality, background outside of the classroom. She has also launched a program called Girls Encoded, which is a program designed to develop the pipeline of women in computer science and retain women who entered that field um, at Michigan. Um, her research also includes lie detection software, and um, algorithm-based systems in identifying cues in fake news stories. So it's a blend of the technology, artificial intelligence, really the culture, as well as using linguistics and um, looking at languages um, across the globe, I suppose. So thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, I think I've spoken to this association maybe. I remember it was still in the same hotel, but many years back. Um, it was a much smaller group. Um, and it's, it's always great to interact with people whom I know have been with Michigan for a long time. Um, and I'm hoping to have the opportunity to learn from you today. Um, I'll share some of the work that we've been doing and um, I, I love to your thoughts, suggestions, questions. Um, and as I was introduced, I deal with language, so that's what I do. I'm in computer science. Um, I'm curious if there are people here who are affiliated with computer science. Um, which is fine. Um, how about linguistics? Linguistics, OK. Um, School of Information? Wonderful. So, um, I don't think what I will talk about necessarily requires that background, uh, but maybe people who have some background in those fields would connect a little bit more. Um, I'll try to um, present this in a way that regardless of background, um, it will be something hopefully you will connect to because it's really, my point is it's all about, um, about the people. So um, a lot of the work that I do is under the umbrella of computational linguistics. Um, and I'm curious how many people have tried ChatGPT? How many you have heard of it? Okay, so about everyone. I do encourage you to try. Well, it's still free, who knows? Um, but it's, um, it's actually a system that's product of work in computational linguistics, or also called natural language processing. Um, and it's really using a lot of language to do something smart with it. And so that's what um, we do in my lab, computational linguistics, and we work with language using computational approaches. And a lot of what we do has led with impressive results. I mean, ChatGPT is one of them, but there is much more. So this is what's stealing the media attention these days. Uh, but there is a lot happening also in machine translation, for instance. Um, there are a lot of languages out there being able to communicate regardless of the language you speak. Um, there is a lot happening in, say, summarization and, and all these other areas where we use language, which is pretty much everywhere. Um, and so a lot of the, the work that we do has to do with representing words. Um, the formulation that's currently typical is to represent words as vectors, so really as numbers. Um, with the goal of being able to compute. So similarly to how you add 2 plus 2 and you get 4, uh, maybe we can also add words like or subtract, like we can subtract maybe men from king and then add to woman and possibly get queen. 
Um, so the vector representations help with that. Um, so there is a lot of progress in terms of word representations, also uh, sentence representations, um, or relations between words, figuring out what's subject, what's object, what's um, the event happening, actions, and so forth. Now, much of what has been done so far um, assumes uh, one size fits all. So it assumes language is what everybody uses. So regardless of who uses the language, eventually this representation should be all the same. So where we are coming is to say that maybe that's not really true. Maybe there are different ways of perceiving the world um, through how people would use language. So we can get at that through language. Um, so you could think, for instance, which is some of the work you've done, um, like there are, it turns out, 40 plus different countries that use English as their official language. Now, whether, say, people in the US who use English would really mean the same thing when they speak English as, say, somebody in Australia who also uses English, or UK, or Singapore, that's not necessarily always the case. So there might be certain words which are used the same, but there is also, turns out, quite a few words which are not. So um, this is what we have on one side. We have computational linguistics which deals with language as if it's one thing, right? So if we have English, it's all English. It doesn't matter who said what. Um, we create some representations. <laughs> now, on the other side, obviously, we have people, right? So people in this room who have certain interests, certain values, behaviors, and so forth. There might be other group of people in Australia, another one in Singapore. Even within the same country, obviously, you have different groups of people. Um, and this, in general, is the purview of social sciences. So a lot of the work that we do in my lab is really connecting these two. And there could be two kinds of connections. Um, one that's going from computational linguistics um, to social sciences. So you use what we can do to analyzing language to apply to social science. For instance, there is a lot of work that would, instead of going sur with surveys, which is the traditional approach in, say, psychology. So if you want to figure out what are somebody's values, you can come up with a survey, and then I will ask it in this room, you fill the survey, and then I have some conclusions. Or alternatively, I could look at what you wrote, right? So say you have some public blogs, and I would analyze that, so the language that you use, and based on that, I can infer something about the values. So computational linguistics can be, and it is used, as a way of inferring things about people. Um, now, the other direction is also going the other way around, where you use what you know about people to do better computational linguistics, so to build better, uh, better models. And what I will want to talk about today um, is this latter direction on how what we know about people can help us in building models that are better, like whatever better we mean. It could be more accurate, um, more aligned with, uh, with people, and so forth. All right. So. Um, I don't have the screen in front of me. I don't know, is there a way for me to get that laptop um, here or it's connected there? What do you need? I would need to know which slide I'm on uh, mm -hmm. without picking on the side. So if I could have it here, that would be easier. Um, if not, that's, that's fine too. You're on, you're on the slide there. Right, right, I can see that. It's just like it would have been more natural, but that's okay. So. Um, I know, it's just it's not natural. I don't look, I have to look sideways to know where I am. So, um, but that's, that's fine. You want to walk around? We can take the mic off of that thing and walk around. Um, I could maybe do that, and so then I'll, um, I, can, I can do that. And how long is that talk for? How long is that? Okay. About half hour. So can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is a work that uh, we've done together with one of now former PhD students. Um, she's a research scientist at Adobe, um, and then also a former um, postdoctoral um, fellow on looking at how people would use language differently when they come from different communities or different cultures. And I'm curious how many of you know about linguistic relativism? 
some. Um, I think it's one of the coolest theories. It's one of my obsessions. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about it. Um, the theory states that people with a different linguistic background would think differently about the world. Um, and this was first promoted by Safir and Work. So this were advisor and student pair uh, back, I think, in the 50s. Um, and they were looking at language used by different tribes and then trying to associate the language with ways that they were interacting with the world, whether there would be like time perception or um, whether it's um, spatial orientation and other things. And here is a more modern take on the linguistic relativism, this time from Lera Borodisky's lab. So she's a professor in uh, cognitive science um, at the University of California. And in an experiment, what she's done, she had a concept like sun, <coughs> which refers to that celestial body that we see in the sky, and she brought in participants. In one setting, she brought in participants from Mexico, who are native speakers of Spanish, and asked them, what do you think about sun? Right? So you can think to yourself, what do you think about sun? So what are some attributes that come to mind? <coughs> and then she repeated that, but this time she brought in participants from Germany. So they were like, their native language was German, and asked the same question, what do you think about the sun? Now it turns out, usually there is a long distribution, so people come up with all sorts of different answers. But you can still do some clustering on each of these groups. So it turns out that the people from Mexico, um, they will refer to the sun as being big and strong, whereas the people from Germany would more often say the sun is nice and warm. So I'm curious if people have any intuition as to why is that, why there was this Geography. So geography and climate, that's usually the counter reaction to what I'm going to say, like maybe that's why. Um, so linguistic relativism theory would be that it has to do with the language. Um, it turns out sun is masculine in Spanish, but it's feminine in German. So people who would be native speakers of Spanish would use more masculine attributes, like big and strong, whereas the German speaker would say nice. Um, nice and warm. And then she repeated this experiment with multiple words um, and found pretty consistent um, associations that were influenced by the gender of the nouns. Now, um, so this is a paper titled Sex, Syntax, and Semantics. And what we said, well, can we do this at scale? So she was literally bringing people into the lab, and you can only ask about that many words. But I would say, well, if we relax a little bit, we don't really go out after culture, it's more like location. We don't go across languages. We keep the language constant, like English, but we do go in different countries, like Singapore, Australia, and so forth. <coughs> and then we can look at scale. So because we have this power of computational linguistics, we can run it for thousands of words and see for which words can we tell automatically who's the speaker. Right? So say if I have a statement that would say, talk about the sun, it says the sun is strong, can I predict who said this? Was it an Australian who said this, or was it an American? And for those words for which I can predict that, chances are there is something that's different about that word. And then I can zoom in and do more, uh, more analysis. So this is what we've done. Um, the setup is pretty much what I said. We take one word, it could be sun, or it could be something else. Then we look in a lot of public writings of people. So this would be blogs for which we know who are the authors. Not necessarily individual, so I would not say, well, it's this person or that person, but it's more, these are Australians. So Australians wrote these blogs, or Americans wrote these other blogs. And then we find a lot of examples for that one word. So we find a lot of examples for sun, as spoken by Americans, a lot of examples of the word sun, as said by Australians, and then we run a classifier on top of that. Classifier meaning that you will you may have heard of neural networks, there's the more modern classifiers, but there are many others where you automatically, based on the word that you see, you can automatically predict something. Like in this case, we want to predict who said it, Australian or American. Okay, so that's sort of our pipeline. And then for those words for which we find differences, then we can zoom in and um, try, to, try to see what, we, what else we can learn. So we had about 1,500 words uh, with coming from a lot of blog posts, so almost a million blog posts uh, split between Australia and US. 
Um, since then, I will not talk about that. We grew that to 12 different countries, so we have much more representation. Um, right here is these two countries. Uh, we made sure this is balanced over time, so we don't capture a certain event, like there were the Olympics in Australia. Obviously, people will talk about the Olympics, so we don't want to find those associations, and that's the reason for going across time. Um, and then, essentially, we follow the pipeline that I just mentioned, where we extract information for each word from each example, and then run through this, um, through this classifier. Now, in terms of how we represent a word, um, I can just skim over the details. We look for each word, so again, consider the word sun. We'll look at what we see to the left of the word sun, what we see to the right. Uh, what are the some relations in terms of words, like what's the verb, uh, what's the modifier, so um, what are the sentiment that's expressed around, is it like positive or negative sentiment, and these are all things that we can gather automatically, so eventually we end up with a vector representation like this, which will tell us something about this particular example where the word sun occurred. And now we have some thousands of examples for the word sun, some coming from Australia, some from US, and we can see to what extent we have some predictive power. Um, so all in all, overall, we got as a result 58%, which if you were to just randomly guess between Australia and US, you will get 50% because the data was balanced. So it means that there is some signal overall. I'm showing this just to make the story complete, but this is not necessarily the one piece that we are after. Um, we really want to find those words for which there is a bigger difference. So this is just the average. Um, then we started looking for specific words. And this is one word, for instance. So the word travel, um, turns out we can tell apart who said travel with almost 75% accuracy. And these are some two examples. So I want you to guess who said it. And again, the candidates are Australia um, or US. So first, discover a beautiful patchwork of fishing, farming, and forestry activities by traveling to the region. And second, showcase your nephritic attitude the next time you travel with this laptop bag featuring a Grey's Anatomy illustration of a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> so who thinks that the first one is Australia? If you can raise your hand. Who thinks that the second one is Australia? Okay, so there is some split. Um, it turns out first is Australia and second is is US. And here are some other words for which we can tell again. One that I found particularly interesting and I meant to dig deeper, it's happy. So it turns out people are using happy quite differently to the point that you can tell them apart. So you can say, again, it's 70% accuracy compared to 50%. So there is signal on how Australians would talk about happy versus American. So I think that's very, very interesting. Travel is the one I showed, and there are, um, there are a few others, and these are just examples. There are about 400 words for which we've seen this like really large, and again, large, take it with a grain of salt. It's significantly better than the 50%. So the other thing that we've done is also zooming in, um, and I know the story goes, don't put formulas in your slides. Um, here I am. It's really <laughs> something that's done automatically to try to infer what are the different topics that a certain collection of documents talks about, right? So for instance, if we talk about words, like travel, um, I could go and look in a dictionary and say these are the different meanings of travel, but then I'll also have to go in my data and assign those meanings. Or the other way I could do it is I have all these examples for travel, and I could use topic modeling, which is an automatic clustering on top of the data they will tell me, well, these are about beaches, um, these are about traveling by plane, so what are the different topics which are inferred sort of bottom up? So that's what we've done for the words for which we could tell apart who's speaking, Australians or Americans, um, to find the, the different topics. And here is an example that I like which came out of our data. So university was one of the words um, that turns out that you can tell who's saying university. Um, and when we did this topic modeling, like finding what are the different topics where the word university appears, uh, we found about 10. 
And then when we map them to data from Australia and data from US, we found a different distribution. So there are these 10 different topics that everyone is talking about. But turns out, so the pink is what Australians are talking about. Like the third topic um, is what Australians talk more about, or the ninth one, whereas dark blue is what Americans are talking about. So whenever Americans say university, it will be about that first topic. So I'm curious to hear from, from you, what would you talk about, or what would you think when you say university? Learning. College? Learning. Learning? Sports. Research. What was that? Research. Research? Okay, I've also heard sports. Um, so it turns out that this is so the dominant topic, the pink again is Australia. So when Australians talk about university, they will say the thing that we mostly heard, education, students, research, and so on. Now when Americans talk about university, guess what? So it's uh, <laughs> sports. Um, so we see game, football, basketball, and so on. So somebody got it right. Um, which tells you something, and again, keep in mind these blogs are not collected from people like you who are associated with the university. It's really blogs by lay people from everywhere. So this is sort of the public perception in US of university. And I mean, if you think about it, it's actually it's true, right? So there's a big sport culture um, around universities. Uh, maybe I could go, I have actually more than half an hour, so probably I'll do like one more angle to the problem and then we can stop and take some questions and see how it goes. Um, all right, so next what we wanted to see is whether we can build representations that would account for these differences. So our first step was find that those differences exist. Um, next, can we create some representations that actually would reflect those differences. As I mentioned before, what we often do in computational linguistics is to create vectors for words, right? So they would also be referred to as word embeddings. Um, it's usually nowadays they are the byproduct of training a neural network. Um, and they will be the same. Like whether it's you or I speaking or somebody from Kenya, it will still be the same. So all words have the same representation. Now we are challenging that assumption. We really think that the people behind the language actually should make a difference because they would use language differently and it means different things to them. Um, so here we were looking for how we can build such representations that account for differences. So now I have another test. So this is what we started with in terms of data collection is the classic word association task. And maybe you play it or maybe you play it with um, kids or grandkids. Um, you say a word and then you have like, what is the first word that comes to mind? Okay, so if I say cat, what's the first word that comes to mind? Uh, yeah. Dog, animal, okay, so, um, and that's the typical answer. Now, what about this? So if I say sleep, what is the first word that comes to mind? Yeah. Bed, sleep, night. night. What was that? Rest. Rest, okay. Um, but so we see that there is more difference, right? So it's not everybody saying dog or everybody saying bad. There is more distribution. Uh, so now it turns out that this was on the minds of psychologists like a hundred years ago. Word association, but from the f uh, framing of diversity between different groups of people. So this is Kent and Rosanoff in 1910. Uh, they did pretty much what we've done here, ask a word, ask what is the first word that comes to mind, and they've done that with different groups of people, uh, male, female, and then also different ages. And it turns out, for instance, like sleep, the one that we looked at, sort of the young group will say dream, and then the less young will say awake. It looks like you are all young here, so I didn't hear awake from everyone, so that's, that's good. Um, the same would be for food, so there was like a clear difference um, eating versus drinking. And again, keep in mind, it is a long tail, so there's a lot of answers, as we've seen in this room, uh, but there is still some classes, so there is some dominant answer. <coughs> so what we wanted to do is see like how we can replicate and build on that word, my now, 
Um, so first, we needed some data, and we use this crowdsourcing platform, Amazon Mechanical Turk, um, which connects to the Mechanical Turk we know from stories, um, but it's now is like the modern version where you give some tasks, and it's people from all over the world would contribute to your task. So the task we gave is very much what we've seen here, where we would ask people, what is the first word that comes to mind? And we had 300 such prompts including the Kent and Rosano data from 1910, alongside with 200 other words. And then the other thing that we've done, we asked to two groups, US and India. I'll tell you the reason for India is very pragmatic. Um, there is a very large group of people contributing on Mechanical Turk, so we could collect data, both in India and US. Um, in Australia, it was very hard to find, so we switched um, demographics. And then we also asked, all this demographic information. Gender, um, age, um, occupation, education, ethnicity, and, and so forth. And we have some check questions to make sure we don't get spam. Um, so all in all, we collected more than 200,000 responses, similar to, like if you were a participant, we would have gotten like this sleep, bed, like these associations. So here is an example which, which I like uh, from our data. So a prompt was the word bath. And you can think to yourself what's the first word that comes to mind when you say bath. And now we can split because of the um, demographics that of the participants, we can see what's the dominant answer for different groups. So when we look at uh, males from America, the dominant answer is water. When we look at male respondents from India, dominant answer again is water. Now when we look at female respondents from India, uh, the dominant answer is soap. And finally, bubble, <laughs> so that's the female from, uh, from the US. And one thing that you can see is differences, right? So I mean, we are all individuals, and there is some, also some similarities that we'll share with people from our own groups. So here are some more. Um, so for instance, for gender, uh, when you say expect, dominant for male will be nothing. For females, <laughs> the baby. Um, another one, like for location, for instance, if you say admit, India will be hospital, in US we are mid killed. <laughs> <laughs> so we also did some statistics on the data that we collected to see to what extent there is agreement within a group versus across groups. Um, so this is really looking at, if we take one respondent, say from India, and we compare to other respondents from India, uh, what is the agreement that we have. Um, so we see, and just in broad strokes, so if you look. There is a pointer. There is a pointer, I don't know where it's pointing. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, so if you look at the top table, um, those will be agreements within group, so India with India, US with US, or male, male, female, female, uh, whereas bottom will be across groups, so say if we take India, US, like Indians would agree more among themselves in terms of their top response than they would agree with people from uh, US, which again, it's really supporting this hypothesis that was put forward by psychologists 100 years ago, and we confirmed that. Um, so next, what we wanted to see is can we build on this information to create these representations that are accounting for the people behind the language? Again, we went on to blogs. Um, had blogs from India and from the US uh, for which we knew like whether the author was male or, um, or female. And it's a lot of data, so it's some millions of uh, words in these public, uh, public blogs. And what we've done, this is a schematic of a neural network. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with neural networks. Um, they are, a the intention is to replicate what we know about the human brain. Um, so neural networks are actually super simple in idea. They are neurons, so each of these little circles that you see would be referred to as a neuron, and then there are connections between neurons. And each neuron will get multiple inputs, will combine them linearly, means it's really just adding them up with some weight, 
So we like say 0 0.2 times 7 plus 0 0.3 times 8 and so forth. So whatever inputs we get, like if we look at this one here, all the inputs are combined linearly and then there is a simple non-linear function on top of that at the output and then it will produce an output and that goes into another neuron, another neuron and there are multiple such layers that's why it's called deep learning because there are many layers like that. And these are what are typically used these days to train um, word representations. And it's again another trick which I think is super smart and simple where from any single piece of language that you see you can create something to learn from for such a neural networks. So you will look at the word and then from the words next to it you can predict what that word is. So if I say a cat sat on a map, I can take the word sat and try to see can I predict that it's sat there by looking at a cat and on a map. So I look left and right and I want to predict the middle. And with that I can essentially create a ton of training data, a ton of instances that such a system could learn from. And I put say a cat and on a map in the input and then I predict sat. I know it should be set. Initially, it will give me something else, and I say, no, no, go back, readjust your weights, and give me set. And then we'll keep going like that many times, um, and it eventually it gets close to set. And that means that I trained the network. Whenever you hear, again, if you read in the news about ChatGPT, for instance, it's essentially a more, a larger form of this, right? So it's a larger form of training what comes next as a word based on what was said before, when you hear it has like this many billions of parameters, it really refers to those edges. So those weights between edges, that's what parameter means, like how many such connections there are. It just gives you the size of the network. So we did this, but what we've done differently is also add information about who said that a cat set on a map. If it's me, say I'm in US now, so I'm from America, if it's somebody in Australia or in India, we'd also have that label, so who said it? and we add that in the network when we train. And it turns out that that can actually make a difference. So we now create representations that are more akin to who used that particular word. And I can show you some results. Again, it's just numbers, but it's really the core idea that you can actually do better by doing this. Um, so you can see how we would do, for instance, for gender, if we have something generic, versus if we have a model that accounts for the people behind, uh, behind the language. Um, and this is for gender and then also for, uh, for culture, where especially for, um, for US, uh, we can, for India, sorry, for India, we can see um, significant improvements. And the numbers are small because it really reflects how well can I predict what somebody would say in response to What's the first word that comes to mind, which is what you've done, and you've seen that there is quite a bit of disagreement. So numbers are traditionally low, so whenever we see even a few percentages improvement, it means that there is some signal that it actually makes sense to do it, um, to do it that way. So I want to stop and see what should I do next. Should we take questions? I guess you might have other things to do, and I can adjust. I have other things to talk about, but I can also stop and just Take questions. I'm looking at. Oh no, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> so I'm curious with the language when an artificial intelligence, when you're doing something online and you're talking to a chatbot, how they have to somehow that mech that behind the scene is having to understand my use of language to answer a question online when you get into one of those computer cycles? How does that work? So it's, it's understanding language, it's not understanding your language. After multiple iterations, like I gave the example of ChatGPT, but there are other like chats out there, right? So it's after multiple interactions, it could use what you said earlier on in that particular dialogue to build on that. So that's the only thing that will be you. But otherwise, in a lot of the systems that we see now, they don't really do that. So it's not about you and your interest. It's really just getting close. It's not fully understanding, really. I mean, it's called understanding language, but it's getting close to understanding enough so that it can react in a meaningful way. And it's not about 
you don't necessarily just the language you use. And so that's why, I mean, this would come, and I have also a small section on ethical consideration. At some point, maybe you don't want it to know that it's, it's you <coughs> to build a system that will be maybe more adjusted to you as being, say, I don't know, like here in Ann Arbor, having like living in Michigan or other things that it could build around an individual. Um, so there are also those considerations. Yes? Do we have microphones? Here we go. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about what are the implications of this kind of work in general? I mean, uh, practical implications, number one, and number two, for any implication. I would be interested to hear uh, from the horse's mouth, so to speak. <laughs> so one thing that really motivates me is the fact that a lot of what we see these days in terms of like natural language processing, but even more broadly AI, is really trained on data that I guess obviously comes from the majority, right? So it's whatever majority data we have there, like in this case language. So these systems are representative for that. So then you end up with many situations where if you look at the minority, which is, might be a very large group, but it's minority compared to the majority, they are really not represented in that. So it's not representative for who they are. Um, and one example that, for instance, really um, made me think a lot about it, it was in the early days of the pandemic, um, I was talking with a data science group in Detroit, and a problem that they faced sort of on the ground, it was giving laptops to families for their children, um, and then a lot of these families will call back with questions like, it doesn't connect to the internet, what do I do? Or where do I find this problem and that problem? And it turns out that a lot of these questions were repetitive, right? So the families would ask the same question over and over. And I mean, what we were talking about, like, well, there are question answering systems out there, so you could use that. Turns out it didn't work, uh, because a lot of these question answering systems are built for sort of the majority language, and a lot of these families were speaking the Detroit slang. So it's that kind of like technology that's built with a claim that is for everyone, but it turns out that it's really for the majority. So this is a way of disaggregating data. It's one book that I recommend it to everyone. It's called Invisible Women, um, but it's really about data disaggregation on how when you think in whatever, I mean, this is in AI, but it could be in music, in transportation, everywhere. If you make decisions, or build systems based on what you just look at data without disaggregating, you get systems that are not representative for everyone. So that's one side, I think is the first answer. The second, there could be also downsides, right? So they could be, depending on the size of the group, you may end up with this tiny group that may end up being um, violating someone's privacy, I mean, or the group's privacy, right? So if the group is small enough, then maybe they don't want that to be known, <coughs> for instance. Um, and I know, for instance, I mean, we don't do that kind of work, but I've seen in the media. So for instance, for um, people with different sexual orientations, like some choose to share that with the world and some choose not to share that with the world. Uh, it turns out that from language, you can actually infer certain things that maybe they choose not to. So that might be a space where you wouldn't want to go, right? So building something that's um, aware of somebody's attributes that that person doesn't want to disclose that would be a privacy violation. And so the way we've been going around that is going after large groups. So it's not like going like this very small group that at the end of the day might be intruding on their privacy. But if you have a large group like US, that's, I mean, it's, it's hard to intrude on someone's privacy by using so many people behind the data. I have a question. Um, when it gets back to fact versus fictional or fake news or, um, are you able to use this to predict whether it's it's a true fact versus fiction, or someone made it up, or where it's coming from, like a, a bot from Russia or whatever? You know how they're talking now. How is that true? 
or not on social media? So you can use representation like this. Um, and we have, I haven't talked about here today, but we have worked on misinformation detection. Uh, we also work for a, a long time, and Katie mentioned that, like deception detection. Um, and it turns out there are clues that are in language, and you can use those. So then some of this representation, you can really frame it as a classification. Like you have some data, this you know it's true, this you know it's fake, and you train on that, like you learn from that, and then given a new article, you can say, well, chances are this is true or it's fake. So you can frame it that way. The part that I find difficult, and our first step into misinformation detection was to build on what we've done for deception. There is a difference, which I learned sort of the hard way by figuring that what we build for deception doesn't fully work for misinformation because the intent is not the same. So in deception, if I intend to deceive you, turns out that I would use certain language clues, which you may not figure out, but the computer can. Whereas in misinformation, sometimes it could be disinformation, so I intend to deceive you, but sometimes it could be I just believe that. So if I say, I think vaccines are wrong, which is one of the popular ones out there, maybe I truly believe that. So I'm not intending to deceive you, I'm just maintaining my argument. And so in that case, looking for just surface, like language clues is not enough, you need to also connect to some knowledge bases and verification and fact checkers and all that. So it needs a little deeper approach to figure that out. But up to a certain point, you can also use language analysis. Are there any questions? So you chose blogs to pick your words from. Did you sense that blogs are used across all genders and across all age spans? In countries? In countries? And countries? Uh, so not all countries use blogs, for instance. So it turns out that different countries have different preferences for media. Um, so we try to get, like, use those countries for which we had enough representation. I mentioned that I mean, just literally like two weeks ago, we had a much bigger um, journal article that looks at like, 12 different countries and different professions, like including professions, like a computer scientist turns out things a little differently than say a musician, uh, which is an effect of their training. Um, so we try to use, to look for those communities for which we had enough, um, enough data, but not all countries would have. So some prefer Instagram, some are all on Facebook, but then Facebook you cannot really access because it's private. So, it, it depends, and that's a very good question. And then the other, I'm not, it's not what you asked, but just as a disclaimer, blogs are not necessarily fully representative of the population. Like, I don't know how many of you have blogs, for instance. I don't have one. So it's really those people who are out there and blogging, so it's that chunk of the population, which as large as it is, is not the full population. Okay, thank you. Yes. Kind of a comment. Um, are you afraid that the language is going to become boring by like filling in things like that automatically? Or am I, or am I interpreting wrongly? Uh, I didn't get to the last part of my talk, okay. which was like humor generation. So I think there are very creative ways to use this. Um, up to this point, I would because this is really just a way of like creating representations, which can do it. Like I haven't talked about that. You can use for humor. You can use for stories. So it's not, uh, it's not boring. The part that and it's not what I talked about here, but that I'm afraid of is with all this. I mean, I shouldn't say afraid. I'm not afraid, but it's more like something that's on my mind. Like there is a lot of this called generative AI, which is really surfacing now. Like ChatGPT is an example, and there are others. There are lots of these models coming out there where it's really easy to generate something, right? So I would encourage you to try just to see how it works, and I think you'll be impressed, right? So you put a so-called prompt. So you can say, tell me a story um, with a group of people in an arbor dining at a hotel. And it will just generate a story, right? So it's very powerful in terms of that. It's because it's learn from a lot of data, but eventually at some point it's still uniform in what it says. It might look creative from one story to the next, but I'm thinking if now the internet would be filled with all, all these one system generated stories, it will become very consistent, even if we cannot 
tell apart with the naked eye that these are the same, but eventually will be the same star, the same thing that's powering all this data. Um, and that's something that I think it, if it happens that way, there will be a lot of this AI generated language out there. Um, it will, in a way, overheat us. So we'll start liking that more, we'll not value diversity as much. So I think there is a good point there. Uh, but we are still to see. So up to now, I don't think we've seen much of that. Are there? Yes. When students are, your students are studying with you, the students who are studying with you, when they graduate with undergraduate or graduate degrees, what are those careers like? I mean, what do they do with that <coughs> expertise? All sorts of things. <laughs> Pretty much anything you could think of. Um, like if you mention like undergrads, for instance, many of them will go and work in, um, a lot of them in the large companies, like the big tech companies. Um, some also in other disciplines where CS expertise is needed. And then when it comes to like graduate students, like PhD students, um, some will go on and become research scientists, like say big tech companies. Um, some will go and become professors, whether they're research professors or teaching professors. Um, some will have their own startups. Um, so it's very, very broad. Mm -hmm. Some will choose, like the student that I mentioned, a partner, she chose, she's working with Adobe. That's just like one example. Like it's a big tech company, but she wanted to go back to India, so we'll go back to their countries to stay with their family. So it's, it's very, very broad. I was listening to a podcast this morning on 538, and it was questions, is a good use of a survey? Will AI be the end of humanity as we know that, as we know it? I think that's a bit extreme, but do you have any concerns about how AI is going to affect society? I'm generally very positive. I'm positive by nature, regardless of AI. Um, but I think AI does have the ability to improve us. And the example that I like thinking about is a big AI success from many years back. So we can also reason to implications is chess. Right, so chess, we had AI systems that beat the world masters. Right? So we could, one take on that could have been, well, we are done, we solve it, let's go home, close chess. It didn't work that way, right? So we still see all these chess champion championships with world masters and all that, so it still stayed in the human world. But the benefit, which I personally really enjoy, I mean, I like chess, but I'm not necessarily like, definitely, but it's not like championship and other things but I can train with an AI, right? So I, I get myself better without necessarily being a teacher. If I feel like doing a puzzle at, I don't know, 2 a.m., I can do it. I don't need a teacher to tell me. So I think that, to me, is a very good lesson on how AI got really good. I mean, at the point of exceeding the best humans out there in a certain ability. And we manage as society to take really the positive side to it, right? So we still continue playing and enjoying as a society, but then we also have this cool thing. And I'm thinking the same for tools like these. So it's in a way, ultimately, it's up to us what we're going to do, right? So it could have negative implications, right? Uh, or we could turn it into something that's really changing humanity for, uh, for the better. So I'm, I think it's, it's all good to me. You are optimistic. <laughs> how, how do you determine whether something is ethical or not ethical in AI? Oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, the good news on that is that there is there are a lot of people who are thinking about that, um, to the point that there is even an entire conference, which is AI and ethics. So it's like it, it grew an entire conference, um, which speaks to the attention that it receives. Um, the part that I find quite difficult when thinking about it is that people themselves don't agree among themselves what's ethical and what's not, right? So there are certain things, I mean, there are the classic trolley problem and all that, uh, and maybe you would agree or would not. Um, but then there is more in terms of values and what you should do and other things, which you see clear differences between cultures. So now if I say I want to make a system that's ethical, who's ethical value should I embed in that system? And that's not 
that's not very clear. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's very difficult also because we ourselves, I mean, philosophers, have talked about this for a long time and thought about it and we all think about it. But at some point, it's even very hard to spell out what are our ethical considerations, let alone the fact that we don't often agree. Um, so it's a big, it's a big question. We have time for one last question, if there is another last question. But th thank oh, you. Oh, I didn't, oh, did you see a hand? Yeah. Right. Oh. Should I wait for a microphone? So maybe this reflects my sort of lack of understanding, but uh, I come from a healthcare background, and so generally when there's something wrong with you, you go to your doctor, practitioner or whatever and you tell them in your own words what you think is wrong or what's bothering you or whatever but people use different words and different ways of explaining and probably some people the more articulate they are about communicating that to the provider maybe they're advantaged in healthcare because it's easier to find out what's wrong with them so I was sitting here thinking is it possible that this kind of work by looking at word meanings and different groups could possibly empower people who don't really have the healthcare background or even language to explain real well what's wrong with them, but maybe patterns of language could be um, tracked to maybe better diagnose people whose language skills aren't really as strong as others. And that's an excellent question. Um, I think that will be is sort of the harder direction to go from patients to doctors. What I've seen, I wouldn't say commonly, but I've seen applications that look the other way around for patients to understand the doctor, so get more complex language to simplify it. Now, in what you are saying, there could be like different language and it could be like translation which understands healthcare terms to translate maybe like if the doctor speaks English and the patient only speaks Spanish to make that bridge. But the other thing is like how you express yourself that the doctor will better understand you, eventually better treat you, which goes, to me it goes also beyond language. So there is something about language. Um, the one thing that we've actually been thinking together with the collaborator is also helping people, and actually we had patients in mind, to think of the questions to ask the provider. So if you say, whatever, prostate cancer at this level, um, and then it will suggest you, like this would be some good question to discuss, and then you can choose from there, which is a little bit in the direction of what you said. So it will help you think about what will be relevant for other maybe patients like you to ask, which will help with that communication. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a very interesting space to facilitate this communication between different levels of expertise. Right, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, thank you. It was very interesting. I'm, um, it's like a topic we may have to keep going back to. <laughs> it's going to be part of our lives, and it's a matter of better understanding in terms of understanding how it works and how it can be an advantage in so many ways. I, I language eventually is everywhere. Yes, exactly. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you for the talk. And we'll see everybody else in May. Thank you.